Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our lecture concerning the runtime stack and scope. We'll go ahead and get started here in just a moment. I'm streaming this uh, lecture live. And so for those of you who would like to meet up live, you certainly can, but I'm recording it as I know that each of you have very likely uh, travel plans for the holiday. And uh, our schedules during this time of year are often quite hectic. So I will be recording this and posting a link so that you guys can watch this at your leisure as well. All right, to wrap up our discussion of basic semantics, we are going to now extend our discussion of functions and how functions are managed with respect to uh, their invocations, to some degree their definition, and how local variables, local scope, and the function call chain is maintained in many programming languages. And we'll do this within the context of assuming a standard von Neumann machine We'll look at some of the underlying nitty gritty details and some of the concepts and theory related with the overhead right, and uh, applications. So we'll go ahead and dive in. And again, this will wrap up our, our general discussion of basic semantics and moving along with the rest of the class. And you guys are now able to uh, complete and wrap up some of the final touches for your mini scheme interpreter. And the next topic we'll be covering is object-oriented programming. And this will provide a nice segue for the addition of the CLOS system for your Project 3 submissions. As many of you have possibly noted, the Project Number 3 instructions have been released. So if you do complete Project Number 2 early, feel free to read ahead. And feel free, of course, to also get started with your Project 3 submission. All right. So a few of the topics we're going to cover here. Again, we're going to look at the overhead associated with function invocations uh, and their applications and implementations in von Neumann machines. Right, we'll look at how we can implement this without using a centralized runtime stack and what we gain by using a centralized runtime stack. We'll look at some more complicated programming language concepts. Uh, and identify what happens if we have static scoping versus dynamic scoping. What happens if we allow for nested subprograms? That is, if we design a programming language such that programs can be defined within the scope of other programs or functions can be defined within the scope of other functions. Right? What this entails and how this might have to change our infrastructure uh, so that we can manage scope appropriately. Right? And so these are the concepts, some of the more advanced concepts and topics that you guys are facing right now while you're designing your interpreters. You know how to keep scoping straight, how to keep all of this, um, uh, the running environment, the runtime environments, uh, the ability to bind identifiers to values straight when you have functions, possibly calling functions, and uh, implementing the static scope that we're implementing now in in our scheme interpreters. And we'll also look at blocks and how these are often implemented in programming languages. At nameless scopes or nameless subroutines, if you will. And uh, we'll provide a few examples of each as well. Right, so to dive in, first we'll just look at some basic semantics of what we mean by function calls or function applications and returns and return values. So as you guys are familiar, again, you guys are familiar with a lot of this nomenclature, but some of the nomenclature you might not be as familiar with. So we'll go ahead and just introduce this. Um, methodically. So a subprogram call and return operations of language are often referred to together as the subprogram linkage. So the general semantics of the calls of subroutines uh, will be discussed as follows. There's about 10 or so steps that are performed. Uh, again, to the programmer, this is done behind the scenes, but as you guys know in some of the hardware courses you've taken, there's a lot of memory management that needs to go on to make sure that parameter passing and return value passing is going on uh, correctly and that our function call chain is maintained. And, but of course, the general semantics, uh, there's a number of concerns if you're designing a programming language and or implementing the programming language that is an interpreter or a compiler. Right? A number of concerns that you need to address when, uh, when implementing functions for your programming language such as what sort of parameter passing methods are you allowing for? 
and how are they going to be facilitated? Right. Are the local variables going to be stack dynamic local variables? Or are they going to be heap dynamic? Are you only going to allow for static variables? So, And then based on your decisions, how are you going to implement? How are you going to facilitate uh, those types of variables? How are you able to save the execution status of a calling program? So when a calling program calls a subroutine, the calling subprogram is halted. Right? But control and scope is handed back to that calling subroutine at some point, as noted in our previous lecture, and as you guys have learned over the past three or four years. And how is transfer of control and returned arranged and facilitated? Right? And if we have an allow for the nesting of subprograms, how do we resolve scope in these situations, both conceptually and mechanically? And so a number of concerns arise when implementing functions in a programming language. Right. As we know, there are a number of parameter passing models and ways to allocate local variables. And so let's go ahead and address a few. First, we'll go over the steps necessary for our calls. So let's look at our simple um, let's do this first example, assuming that we have uh, no centralized stack. And this is not true, but again, for those of you who have taken a hardware course, uh, you understand that you could, of course, implement uh, an architecture and a system such that you don't have a runtime stack, at least a centralized runtime stack. Uh, there are pros and cons to this, of course, right? but we'll look at the uh, at implementing subprograms, assuming no centralized runtime stack first, and then we'll look at implementing a centralized runtime stack. So basic call semantics, save the execution status of the caller. Again, we need to return control back to the caller at some point. When we do so, the state of computation must be maintained to maintain a valid state of the data and of computation. Right? Uh, and so this information must be saved in some way or shape. We must have a means to facilitate parameter passing. Right. In most definitions of functions, we have parameters. Right? We have binding of values to those parameters before the execution of the sub-program. Right? And so we need to provide a means to do this. The subroutine upon completion will often have some return, or uh, not the return, sorry, I'm skipping ahead to the return value, but this word here we're talking about the return address. Uh, next, we need to know uh, how uh, facilitation of control is going to be uh, maintained. That is, how can we return control back to the caller? So the return address for control needs to be passed on and or saved in some way. Right. Then we can transfer control to the called function at that point. Right. Once that is done, we can then return. So after the subroutine has finished execution, right, again, at this point, control is handed off. The parameter values were bound. Right, the return address was passed on. So we know where to return control back to. At this point, we can now simply allow the subprogram to execute. Right. Of course, depending on our passing scheme, we might need to uh, confirm that we can access variables out of scope depending on what type of in or out mode parameters we have. And, and we need to make sure that we make use of those parameters appropriately. Right. If at the end of execution this function is to return a value, that value must be computed and placed in a location where the caller can access it. At that point, we can then return control back to the caller. Right right after restoring execution status of the caller. Right, so this is a simple subprogram. Here we don't have a centralized stack, but we do simply need a, way, a means to maintain status information. Right. Hold, store, and pass parameters. We need to be able to save return address. We need to be able to save the return value. And then possibly we'll need some memory for temporary locations. 
depending on the memory management scheme, this could be organized, all this information could be organized into very uh, simple blocks associated with each subroutine. You could keep the code and data separate or not. And right? of course, you'll need some means to, to protect the data, uh, but you can separate it right, in, in a number of different ways. And again here, you have the code and you have the data. Right. It's important to keep track of these uh, and understand that these are different when allocating to memory and when hand control back. And right. in many ways, when we hand control back, right, we're handing control or an address to instructions, not data. Right. And when we hand access to local variables back, we'll be handing access via the data segment and not the code segment. Right. These various blocks associated with the data or organization of memory with each of the functions or subroutines right, is often referred to as an activation record. Right. Here's an example of an activation record for a simple subroutine. So how do we organize our data, et cetera? Well, again, in many, uh, many organization schemes, we will keep data and the code separate. Again, this is for uh, security, safety, reliability of the code so that data uh, should never be executed. It's, it's a good idea to keep them very far apart when possible. Right. And so here we'll have various chunks associated with each subroutine or each scope. So main will have a chunk. Subroutine A might have a chunk. Subroutine B, subroutine C. And if we don't have a centralized runtime stack, then for the data segments here, we'll need to be able to store all of our local variables in this chunk. Any parameters, right? any memory reservations will need to uh, pass parameters, right? including return values and the return address. And here return address refers to the memory location of the code to be executed where the caller was halted. So it's where we're handing control back with respect to execution. That's what we mean by return address here. Right. So each of the subroutines will have, of course, a code segment, a code chunk, chunk of memory to store its code, and then a chunk of memory to store any of its local variables, parameters, and some other temporary overhead to allow for the facilitation of a function call chain, such as a return address. Right. However, in most computing systems, we implement a more complex scheme, uh, which allows for recursion and uh, a few more bells and whistles, which help us to facilitate scope, and more complex scoping. Uh, and this is a centralized stack. And, uh, this more complex activation record means that we have a little bit more overhead uh, and management associated. Uh, with with allowing for recursion, as we can have multiple instances of activation records for the same function uh, open right, on on our function call chain at any given time. Right? And in order to maintain all of this correctly, there's a few more overhead variables right, other than return address that we'll need to keep track of right, with respect to keeping track of local scope. Uh, keeping track of various uh, scoping parameters and overhead, such as you know static links and dynamic links, uh, and we'll see a few examples of that moving forward. All right. So at the very minimum here, with allowing for stack dynamic local variables, right to our return address, we're going to add a dynamic link, right, which is going to allow us to return back to the caller, and we will also have potentially a link which will allow us to um, to access its static scope uh, depending on the scoping uh, scoping approach that's used for your programming language. All right. So here are some of the items that we're going to need to add, and here's some nomenclature to help us along the way. Again, the activation record format is static, so this has to be known at compile time. The dynamic link points to the top 
of an instance, the activation record of the caller. So again, this is a way for us to keep track of the caller scope so that after we hand control back, we can also uh, we can also give back the scope of the caller. Right. So this is going to, again, point to the top of the activation record of the caller. We'll look at this with an illustration here shortly uh, to see how our stack unrolls and how we can use this dynamic link. And an activation record instance is dynamically created when a subprogram is called. Again, this stack frame or activation record instance is opened up on the stack uh, to allow for the allocation of local variables so that that corresponding subroutine can be executed. Activation records reside within the runtime stack. And another piece of overhead that's often used within centralized runtime stack implementations is the environment pointer. Right. So this is used to point to the base of the activation instance of the currently executing program or subroutine. This allows for direct access to local variables that are in scope currently, in the scope of the subroutine that is currently being executed. And so here's an example of an activation record for a C function or a C subroutine. This function's name is sub. It has two parameters. It has a local array and a local float. Right. So for each activation record, we have a return address. That's how we return control back to the caller. Each one of these, right, each subroutine has one of these. And we have a dynamic link. And this dynamic link is the base or it provides access to the local variables of the calling subroutine. And so here, these are two memory addresses of the caller. The return address is the memory address of where we want to hand control back. And that's the caller's code to be executed. Right. And the dynamic link, which is the local variables of the caller. And this is how we hand scope back to the caller. Along with that, here we see that the caller will also pass in parameters. Here we have two, so we need two memory buckets for the two parameters. And then we have six chunks here for our local variables. Here, since we've allocated this array on the stack, it's local. So here, all five buckets of this array are reserved on the stack. And then we have one bucket here for our float variable. Given this extra overhead, the semantics associated with a call and return a little bit more complicated. There's a bit more overhead. And we'll just go over each of the steps one at a time. And so the caller's actions, if a function is invoked, right, the first thing we need to do is allocate and load a new stack frame. So how do we do this? We create an activation record instance. Save the execution status of the current program unit. Compute and pass the parameters pass or copy up the return address, right? along with the right, dynamic link, right, uh, which is done here, and then transfer control to the call. Right, the callee will then, of course, save that dynamic link so that not only can we, will the called, the callee be able to return execution control, but also scope to the caller. Right. It will allocate the local variables right. and then allow for the execution of the code. Right. Once the code is executed, then it's time to terminate right, and return back to the caller, which involves popping the current activation record or the callee's activation record off the stack and returning control. So how is this done? Right. Uh, if there are pass by value results or out mode, uh, out mode parameters and return values, they're moved to right, these corresponding actual parameters. If the subprogram is a function, its values move to a place accessible by the caller, thus facilitating the return. The stack pointer, right, which points to the top of the stack, 
is set such that it is essentially moving down to the bottom or the base of the current activation record, thus effectively popping it off the stack. Okay. You then restore execution status to the caller and then transfer control back to the caller. And so we reset the environment pointer and reset the PC or the program counter so that the caller again has control to execute. All right, so here's an example of uh, execution of a number of subroutines and what the stack would look like at various states of execution. So here on the left, we have in C-like language, uh, three functions along with a main method. Here note that main calls fun one, fun one calls fun two, and fun two calls fun three. So a really simple example. So upon initial execution, main has one local variable and then makes a call, right? Passes that parameter to fun one and then fun one assumedly would execute. And here that fun one has two local variables and then calls fun two. So, at about this point of execution, before we call fun2, the, the stack would look very much like this, where we'd have uh, our stack frame associated with the main method, which has at least the one local variable, like for p. Right? Then, when we call fun1, we open up a new stack frame for fun1. Right? The return address is stored here, so that when fun1 completes execution, we can hand control back to main. The dynamic link points back to the scope or the local variables of the caller, so we can hand not only control back to the caller, but scope back to the caller. And then we have the one parameter that was passed. And fun one also has two local variables, so we need to reserve those two spaces, right? And that is the full activation record for fun one. Our stack pointer, top pointer, is pointing here now. And at this stage of execution. All right. At this point, fun2 is called. Fun2 has one parameter, one local variable, and makes a function call. So here for fun2, we see again that we have the return address, the dynamic link, one memory bucket for the parameter, and one bucket for the local variable. And so this is what fun2's activation record would look like. Note again here the dynamic link points back to the activation record of the caller so that we can return scope to the caller. Right. I see at this point fun3 executes. Fun3 seemingly has no local variables but one parameter. So again we store the return address, the diamond link, and our parameter. So at this point, our stack is completely unfurled. And when fun3 terminates or completes its execution, this stack frame will be popped off. Right? When this returns, then fun2 will return shortly thereafter. Right? And then this stack frame will be popped off, eliminated, all local variables destroyed. Right? And similarly, right, until all subroutines com uh, complete or conclude execution. All right, well that's one way certainly to maintain a function call chain right, and a centralized stack and this can also help with keeping track of local variables. So this is something you guys certainly want to keep in mind when implementing your interpreters as you have to maintain a function call chain and maintain fairly complex scope, static scope, um, but certainly you'll need to keep track of which variables are local. But note here that our centralized stack in this example doesn't help us with respect to nested functions, right, or the idea of global scope, right? There's no scope hierarchy here maintained in this simple version of a centralized stack.
that would help us to resolve a variable name right, if it wasn't found in local scope. Right? We could pretty easily access a variable in local scope using this sort of setup, but we would need to add something else. Right. Again, using this dynamic chain right, and just simple, lo simple local access, we can facilitate a function call chain and the accessing of local variables. Right. With recursion, this example gets a little bit more interesting because we have multiple activation records on the stack frame open simultaneously from the same function. Right, so here's a, a good example of a recursive function, the factorial function. Right, this function has right, our parameter here, some return value that we need to keep track of in store. Right, so on the first call here, let's say we call factorial of three, we have our main activation record and then the first activation record for factorial. The parameter that's being passed here is three, so that's bound here. And we have our return address and our dynamic link in place. Right. And then we have a bucket reserved for the return address, which we don't necessarily know yet. And at this point, we see that we're going to execute n times factorial of n minus 1. And so at this point, we're going to make another function call. And then so we call factorial again. At this point, we're passing in argument n minus 1. In this scope, n is 3. So we're going to pass in 2. So 2 is bound to our formal parameter n in the second activation of factorial, right, as illustrated here. Right? And again, we will execute another function call, calling factorial a third time with a parameter value of 1 this time. So on the third call, our stack will look like this. The third frame of factorial that's open, the formal parameter will have will be bound to the value of one. At that point, we hit uh, base case, and so we'll be able to return. We'll compute the value, place the return value, so that the caller can access it and re return control back. Right? Pop that stack frame off and repeat. And here's the process of popping off those frames and returning. Again, continuing on at this point, uh, we compute the functional value. We're asked to return 1. And so right, the function value on this third activation frame will be 1. Right. At this point, that value is then going to be returned. and the corresponding product is going to be performed. Right. The product was factorial of n minus 1 times n. So when we return this value of 1 back to the scope, right, we're going to perform 2 because n in the scope is 2. The return value here was 1. 2 times 1 is 2. And so the result or the return value here for this activation record is 2. And then we pop off this stack frame. We move this uh, to so that it's accessible to our caller. Right? We reset the dynamic link, change it back, move the top pointer to the top of the stack here, and then our stack looks like this. Right? At that point, we have access to the 2. 3 is in scope. We perform the multiplication of 2 times 3. The result is 6, and we store it here in our return value bucket. That is returned back to the caller, which was local, which was main. Excuse me. And, and the value of 6 is then stored there. And so that's the uh, collapsing of our stack. Right? Over here on the left, we saw how we unfurled it right? and then how we strung it back up. And so these are good examples of how our stack works right? and how we use it to facilitate not only a function call chain, right? not only local scope, but also recursion.
right. So now we'll go ahead and dive into how we can maintain scope and more complex scope than just accessing local variables right? using some sort of centralized runtime stack. As we brushed on briefly previously in class, we have a static scope and dynamic scope. For a static scope, scope is maintained in a lexical sense. That is, we can identify where bindings occur based on where they are written in the code itself. Right? In many programming languages, the encapsulation of scopes, that is the association with a parent scope and a, a child scope, is related to the encapsulation of scopes. Right? In C++, for example, right, scope is indicated using curly braces. Right? Thus, you can identify lexically to which scope various identifiers are bound based on which matching curly brackets their declarations occur. Whenever we have an enclosing scope relationship, we have a parent to child scope relationship. Thus, if you want to search or resolve an identifier, you would first check in the current scope of execution. If you can't find the identifier in that scope, you would then go up the chain or up the hierarchy, going from child to parent until the variable identifier can be resolved. Dynamic scope is different than that. The scope is not associated statically with where the variable is defined or declared or bound lexically speaking but rather has to do with the dynamic sequence of function calls. Thus, you can get some really wacky and unintuitive results. One of the reasons why dynamic scope is not the most common in many modern day programming languages. Right. We have a parent to child relationship with respect to scopes in the scoping hierarchy in dynamic scope with, uh, or I should say the parent-child relationship with respect to scope and dynamic scoping is the same as the caller-callee relationship. So a caller and callee are the parent and child scopes. So if you have a long function call chain, right, you have a long hierarchy or a long chain of scopes. And so if you're in a callee, for example, and you want to resolve an identifier, that identifier is not bound to that scope, you would check in the parent scope. So where would you check? You would check the scope of the caller, right? which is interesting because this could change depending on who the caller was. Right? Dynamically, you, know, you could have many different functions call the same subfunction. Right? And so this is why this is called dynamic scope because it's unclear what variable is going to be accessed until it's actually accessed during runtime. Right? You can't tell just by looking at the code, for example. Right, it can't be determined statically. It must be, or it is determined dynamically. Thus, the name dynamic scope. All right. Well, one thing to keep in the back of our mind is with dynamic scope, it's easy for us to determine right, uh, which scope is a parent scope when executing. Right? We'll go back to the diagram here. Why? Because we have the dynamic link. That dynamic link is exactly our parent to child link, which would allow us to trace back in the scoping hierarchy if we were to implement a dynamic scope. Right. This again keeps track of the caller right, and the scope of the caller. And we have local variables and access to the local variables of the caller. And we have a chain of these. So we have a dynamic link chain, which would give us the scope hierarchy for a dynamic scope which is pretty cool. However, many programming languages don't use dynamic scope. Dynamic scope, again, not very intuitive. Easy to implement if we have a centralized runtime stack, though, as you can see here. So if we want to implement a more complex static scoping system, we'll need to add a little bit more overhead right, uh, to allow for this identification and or maintenance and facilitation of a scope hierarchy, right, which is not directly related to the runtime stack. Right. 
Thus, we'll need to construct or maintain some sort of static chain, which keeps track of parent-child scope relationships. Right. One way we can incorporate this in the runtime stack is to have what's referred to as a static link in each of the activation records, which points to a parent activation record. In the sense of static scope parent. Right, so the static chain in our activation record should connect it child to parent, child to parent, child to parent, all the way up right, the static scope tree, if you will. Right. The depth to which, uh, uh, the depth of this scope refers to the length of this static chain. Right. Depending on the type of scoping utilized, depending on whether nested subroutines are permitted in the programming language, this depth can be of concern in that it might take a little runtime system a while to resolve an identifier. Right. And, so, um, and so we'll take a look at that and what that, Im that, what that implies here shortly. And again, here, this nesting depth or chain offset tells us how long right, our static ancestor chain goes and how far we need to trace it back in that chain to resolve an identifier. Right. So again, this can become pretty onerous on, the, on a runtime system. And there's also some other design concerns associated with uh, nested subprograms here because this chain can become uh, fairly long, right, potentially. Uh, again, some programming languages allow for this, and they allow for the sub they allow for stack dynamic uh, variables and nested subroutines. Right? Again, this is not a very uncommon thing. It's actually fairly common. Right? Usually within, uh, within this sort of scheme, variables that can be non-locally accessed reside in some activation record, and it must be right, on the stack in some activation record at that point. And the process of loc uh, locating, that is resolving some identifier that's not local, right, is to trace back this static link, find the quote unquote correct activation record instance, which is non-trivial at this point because if we allow for recursion, there might be multiple instances of a parent scope currently open on the stack. <laughs> so which one should we use, right? It's, again, a non-trivial question, certainly a non-trivial design question for those implementing a programming language. And so here's an example, a uh, JavaScript example, where we have a function, right, our main function. And then we have, within the main function, we've defined a bib big sub function, excuse me. Right, and then inside of this function, we've defined a sub one function. Right. And then outside of there, we've defined a sub two function. Right. A, and then inside of sub two, we have a sub three function as well. Right. And then here we have the outside of big sub. Right. And then the end of main. And so at this point, right, we have, we'll go ahead and take a look at the execution at these stages, the resolving of B, right, uh, A, B, and C, which are variables defined in this scope, right, variables C and E defined in this scope, variables B and E defined in this scope, right, and try to see what's going to happen within this example. All right. So again, in this example, reading through the code, main calls big sub, big sub then calls sub two, sub two calls sub three, and sub three calls sub one. Wow. So 
here, I'll go ahead and move this over here. And of course, at the base of the stack, we have our main method, right, which then calls big sub, big sub called sub two, right, and so on and so forth here, All right? Now, the big change here, as compared to our other examples, is that we have a new memory bucket here for a static link. And the static link must be set to keep track of the static ancestor of the current activation record, right? where that activation record was called, lexically speaking, right? Not when it was called, but where it was defined, right? lexically speaking. Right, oops, sorry about that. And so we can see here that the dynamic link and the static links are not necessarily the same. Right, for example, note that sub one, or big sub called sub two, so the dynamic link just traces back to the caller. Sub two called sub three, so the dynamic link just traces back to the caller. Right, and sub three called sub one, so the dynamic link traces back, traces back to the caller. Right? Again, the dynamic link is simply just linking caller and callee not necessarily scope, unless you're using dynamic scope. Right? Instead here, we know that all of these functions, right, at least sub one and sub two, are both defined, lexically speaking, inside of big sub. So their static link links back to their static ancestor. Right? Not their dynamic, not their caller, but their static ancestor. Uh, here, sorry, sub two. Right? Of course, we know that sub three was called inside of sub two, or not called, but defined inside of sub two, as we can see here. Right. So the ancestor for sub three, statically speaking, for static scope, right, was sub two. Sub two's ancestor was big sub. Right. And so here we have our scoping hierarchy maintained on our runtime stack. Again, so if we are implementing a static scope system and you want to keep track of the parent child or the ancestor scope relationships, right, this is certainly one way to do it. So maintaining this static chain is certainly not a trivial process. This sort of information will need to be kept. Uh, that is, parent-child relationship of the static scopes will need to be kept uh, at, if you're implementing a compiler, at compile time that might be kept in a table such that that information can be then easily accessed uh, when the stack is built dynamically. Right? So that information would need to be maintained and saved. Similarly, if you're building an interpreter, you'll need to keep that information somewhere and then use it uh, when appropriate when building a stack or simulating the stack. And so our static chain maintenance uh, at the call, and when the activation is uh, activation record is first built, right, the dynamic link is really just the old uh, top pointer, right? But the static link must be the following, right? Here, most programming languages will have the static link point to the most recent parent scope. Again, we could potentially, if we have recursion. We could have multiple uh, activation records open for the parent scope currently. And so generally, programming languages will choose the most recent. That is the nearest activation record that's currently on the runtime stack. And so that will need to be checked when that activation record is made. And this can be time consuming depending on how recursive right, and how nested the function definitions are. There's two ways. Number one, you can just search the dynamic chain to see which one's the nearest. That could take a while, right? but it'll certainly get the job done. And another one is to keep a cache, if you will, of this information available so that you can easily access a calling scope or I'm sorry, a parent scope, without tracing back the dynamic link. And again, static, cha uh, static chains, 
right, is, is important if you want to implement a static scope. Tracing back the chains can be slow. If you have a time critical process and you have very nested subroutine organization, right, this could provide for unnecessary overhead and a reduced efficiency in your code. Right. From a programming languages standpoint, you might consider, you know, do I really need to design my, my functions to be so nested, right? uh, at least from, from an application standpoint? From the designer standpoint, you might consider, well, how can I make this more efficient rather than chasing all of these static links or these parent links? Another concern when designing your own programming language is what to do with blocks. Code blocks, unnamed code blocks, while loop blocks. And there's a lot of different code blocks. Right? And these blocks generally in most programming languages have scope associated with them. So if you were to declare a variable in that block, it would no longer exist as soon as you exit that block. Right? Uh, and so in that sense, it's very much like a subroutine or a function that's unnamed. Right? And so should you go all out in a sense from a programming language design scheme and treat it just like a subroutine that's unnamed. Like build a whole activation record for this block and right? treat it as though it's a function call right? uh, and, and just implement it that way. That's certainly a reasonable thing to do. Right. Again, treat it as a parameterless or a nameless sub program. It's always called from the same location. Another thing you can do is attempt to simply include it in the enclosed scope. And, uh, and provide some sort of means to destroy the local variables when appropriate, or just allow for that interesting side effect. And uh, many IDEs actually allow for this side effect here if you were to declare a variable in a nameless scope and then attempt to access it later. Right? IDEs will often allow this, just given the way that they simulate blocks. Um, I see this issue uh, quite a bit, actually, in, in some of my intro classes, where students will write their code in this manner. And it will certainly work on their IDEs, but it won't work when you run it on a more a strict version, if you will, of, uh, of C++. Right. Uh, these are two, two interesting methods for implementation. Uh, one of the last things I wanted to talk about was dynamic scope. I, I hinted at it earlier, how it would be very easy to implement, given that we already have all of the overhead needed to implement dynamic scoping on the runtime stack already. So it's actually really easy to implement, but it's generally fairly unintuitive. Uh, and so it's uh, the results is simply that the result is simply that uh, it's not very common in modern day programming languages except for toy languages. Um, again, the the chain that you might have to trace when resolving an identifier can be pretty long, and so it can be inefficient as well. There's a number of ways we can try to mitigate the effects of chasing the dynamic link or chasing up that hierarchy to try to resolve an identifier by allowing for shallow access rather than deep access, you know, chasing the, the sequence of links. Right, shallow access would be simply keeping a centralized uh, array of stacks, if you will, for all identifier names and keeping the closest or most locally accessible right, uh, at the top of the stack so that you can just simply, for example, hash into the structure, go to the top of that corresponding hash bucket, right, and then access the appropriate variable without having to chase any, any dynamic links, for example. Of course, the trade-off here is that you have to maintain this structure, which will have cost associated with it as well. Right, an example to compare a static versus dynamic scope. Here, using uh, this simple language. Right, a simple static scope example. Here we have uh, 
a global variable x. Here we assign its value to be three. Here we have a local variable x within this unnamed scope. Right inside of here we have a, another block, and we change the value of x. Which x do we change here? And if we're using static scope, we change the we would check the parent scope to see if there was an x because one isn't declared here. The enclosing scope is here. And so we would choose this x. That x's value would be two. The global x would be three. So when we print them out, we would print out two and three. Here we would print out two. Here we would print out three. Again, because this x refers to this, but this x refers to this. We can easily determine this statically by looking at the code because this is static scope. Right. Here's a, a fun example where we compare static and dynamic scope. Here we have static scope, two and two. Right. And dynamic scope, we get a different result. So let's see why. Again, in this example, we have a global variable x and a local variable x in main, local variable x in f, a local variable x in g. Here, main calls f and g, and both f and g call h, which simply perform a print. Note here in, in h, we simply say print f, and we print the value of x. Well, note as we step through this execution, main, the first thing we do is change this global variable to two. Right? And then inside of f and g, the local variables are changed. Right. So down here, we can determine lexically, statically, that we're going to print out two if we implement static scope. So if you guys were to implement this in C, and if you were to implement this in C++ right now, you would have a static scope of two. All right. All right, next. And if we were to implement dynamic scope, we would have to resolve these variables based on the function call chain. So here we have x, which is equal to 2. We have f. f calls, all right, uh, main calls f. F has a local variable x called three. H is called. H says to print x. Rather than checking lexically to see where a variable x has been defined, we chase back to the caller. So who called h? Well, f called h. Right? And so we would print out three because there's a variable named x here in this scope, right? which has the value of three. And so that would be printed. And then we would return back to main, call g. G has a variable x named four, calls h. H prints x. There's no x in h's scope, so we return back to the caller right, to try to resolve. Here we see that there's an x equal to four, so then we print out four. And so here we get two different results, three and four. All right, and that's the summary of our talk for today. I'm going to go ahead and shut it down for questions and see if anyone has questions. Oh, hello. Just me, right? Hey, yeah. I think so, Sean. How's it going? Well, it's going well. Uh, nice lecture. It's uh, it great. <laughs> Uh, I, I guess I didn't get the memo. Was was this was I am I supposed to be here or is it just a recording thing for you? Uh, it's both. It was uh, I was doing it live. If you guys wanted to be live, but I'm also recording it as well. Oh wait, this is still being recorded, huh? Right. Oh hi guys, how you doing? Are <laughs> uh, you good? All right. Well, so uh, here's my question. I uh, I posted earlier, so I'm still not 100 percent sure what Evel does. Uh, so for the 
You're talking about eval. Yeah, eval. Uh, eval. Okay. You know, it's supposed to be like a quote that follows it. I understand that if it's whatever that follows it in the quote. I mean, after the quote is, it's kind of like delay, but right. uh, but different from it. Uh, from what I read up, the doc says uh, eval also works with the uh, environment. Could also work with the environment, but I don't remember us talking about it during class. Uh, right. So how uh, how eval is different from delay uh, with respect to environment is where the binding of the arguments might occur. I think, for example, delay. Is hey sean are you still there sorry it's uh yeah i'm mean, I mean, here i didn't didn't really catch what you said there if you if you were talking yeah okay yeah so uh, one of the the main differences, right, in uh, with delay and eval with respect to the environment is uh, where symbols in the list might be bound, identifiers in the list. So delay, uh, for in, intuitively, delay assumes that the list is eventually going to be evaluated, and the binding occurs in the scope where the delay is called. So if there's any arguments in the list, for example. The identifiers are bound at that point, whereas with eval. Right. Okay. No, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay. Whereas uh, eval, the binding occurs uh, more dynamically ad hoc uh, when the evaluation occurs, not where okay, the list uh, was created, right? Sure. I, I think this was in the previous recording. I think I I watched it and it right. talked about this, but. Right, uh, right after you mentioned how uh, the binding of delay occurs when when you declare the thing as being delay, uh, you also said you could implement it the way that it it's more, I guess, ad hoc binded when it was called. Uh, so, is it okay that I implemented the second way that you know that delay works like eval? <laughs> Yeah, I or think so. Or is delay supposed to be binded? I think both are true. I'm sorry, I, 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 I <laughs> No, no, no. No, I, I, so just to answer your question, uh, yes, uh, I think both of your statements are true. But I think you can implement it either way is fine. I think that's a reasonable design decision to make. So if you prefer that it binds uh, early or late, I think either is fine. Just make a note of it when you submit. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, and on that note, so is eval extra credit or is eval uh, part of the you know the the basic package, if you will? Yeah. One one of them is extra credit. So they're each worth five percent, and if you do both of them, you end up with one hundred five. Uh, so. Oh. Uh, all right. right. Uh, so just out of curiosity, can I go above that? Yeah, so if you guys also wanted to, if you guys want to do anything else for extra credit, uh, I ask that you simply send me a proposal for any other uh, add-ons you would like to add to the language. And and I can approve them for extra extra credit if you want to try to go for more than the 5%. All right, sounds good. I hope probably end up doing that and uh, cool. before that the uh, uh we we're supposed to allow rational numbers for this project well correct question is what if what if you have two rational numbers you know have operating on each other right like plus or minus multiply divide is the answer expected to also be rational yes yeah i think that's a pretty good and reasonable result all right and uh just on that note what if one of them is a rational number and the other one is a float? Yeah, feel free to do something reasonable there. Most programming languages would probably 
coerce up or um, allow for a widening conversion. Okay. All right. Well, uh, that's all my questions for now. So, did I did I end up on the recording? Like when you put this on YouTube, are people oh, gonna yeah. hear me? Oh, oh yeah. Man. No, it's great. All You're right. a star. Oh, thanks. Uh, I, my voice doesn't sound too good. I, I wish I had a deeper voice. But... All right. All right. Well, yeah, thanks for joining me and thanks for the questions. And hopefully everyone will benefit from them. And uh, enjoy your break. Be safe. And I'll see you shortly next week. All right, guys. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving.